subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. In this edition of Global Print, I will talk to you about how India is revamping its foreign policy efforts with one eye on the U.S. presidential election on November 3rd, which if you read the American media today, it seems as if uh, U.S. President Donald Trump may lose and his Democratic presidential contender, Joe Biden, uh, could perhaps win this election. But before that, dear viewer, I would like to make an appeal to you. Please do subscribe to The Print you know that we are not behind the paywall and that despite this, all of us at The Print have made every effort to bring to you the best and the brightest of stories and videos from across the country. All our reporters are correspondents. So please do help us in maintaining this free and fair, non-partisan, objective and vibrant journalism that we bring to you at The Print. But back to my column, Global Print, in which I talk about how India is planning to revamp or is revamping its foreign policy efforts with one eye on the U.S. presidential election on November 3rd. And I begin with India's neighborhood, how India is sending uh, Army Chief General M.M. Naravani to Nepal to repair brotherly relations with Nepal. You know that during the COVID crisis, General Naravane had made some very undiplomatic remarks about Nepal's um, attempt to redraw its boundaries, incorporating India's uh, territories, especially in the Lipu Lake area. And at the time, General Naravani had said that it was because of China that Nepal was doing this. Now, uh, the Relations between the armies of India and Nepal are actually quite exceptional. And since time immemorial, uh, they have the both the army chiefs ha get the rank of an honorary general in each other's armies. So there's talk about how these sort of brotherly armies between India and Nepal, which are reflective of this very, very um, close bond between the two countries, uh, right from the civilian sphere to the military sphere. So that's the first. The second is India's ambassador to Bangladesh, Vikram Dora Swami. He reached Bangladesh about a week ago, drove from Tripura to Dhaka. And the first thing he did was to go to this house in Dhanmundi, in the heart of Dhaka, which is the, uh, the family home of Prime Minister Sheikh, Sheikh Hasina. And it was in this house in August 1975 that uh, Sheikh Hasina's entire family, beginning with her father, then the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, was assassinated and the whole family was killed. And this place, Dhanmundi, it's become a bit of a shrine uh, in memory of what the Bangladeshis suffered at the time. So Vikram Dora Swami going straight to pay his respects at the shrine of Bangabandhu, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Back in Afghanistan in Kabul, where Rudrendra Tandon, um, India's ambassador to Afghanistan, has presented his credentials at a time when the Taliban and the Afghan government are locked in talks in Doha, in Qatar, where the Taliban wants to share power with the Afghan government, and they are still figuring out how to do this. So India sending both very able diplomats, Vikram Dora Swami, to Bangladesh, as well as uh, Rudrendra Tandon to Kabul to repair the damage that has, done, has, that has been done to the relationships in both these countries. And most significantly, I talk about how Prime Minister Narendra Modi is going to participate at the BRICS summit hosted by Russia on the 17th of November. Um, and interestingly, will share a video screen with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Now, with India and China locked in Ladakh, where the Chinese have taken hundreds of kilometers of territory, it's quite interesting that Prime Minister Narendra Modi has decided to share screen space with the Chinese president. We know that in 2017, when the Doklam crisis was at its height, the Doklam, of course, the plateau in Bhutan, where Indian and Chinese armies were facing off. At the time, the BRICS summit was to take place in, in a place called Xiamen in China. And India told the Chinese that we are not, that Prime Minister Modi is not going to attend the BRICS summit if you don't go back to the positions that you had taken that the Chinese army doesn't go back to the positions that it had taken uh, before the Doklam crisis began. 
But this time around, the Indians have done no such thing. They have, um, of course, in all their diplomatic communication, as well as that between military commanders, they've been talking about restoring status quo, that the Chinese PLA troops must get, get back behind the line of actual control. But what is significant about Modi attending the BRICS summit is that because it's hosted by the Russians, India does not want to antagonize Russia and its president, Vladimir Putin, because that would be a real slap in the face of the Russian president that one of its partners, uh, India, is refusing to come to the BRICS summit. Now, remember that India is still hugely dependent on Russia for its military hardware and that while some diversification has been taking place, India has been buying a lot of stuff from the Americans, for example, a large amount, about 60 percent or 70 percent, between 60 and 70 percent of Indian hardware of of, uh, the armaments of tanks is still sourced from Russia. So in a crisis in Ladakh, India certainly doesn't want to antagonize the Russians and to um, and it would like the Russians to maintain this pipeline of military hardware. But equally important is that as this Ladakh crisis gets into the winter months, both Russia and China are members of the, uh, are both permanent members of the UN Security Council. So if the Ladakh crisis escalates or degenerates, whichever way you want to look at it, India certainly wants the Russians on its side to help stave off a potential uh, flashpoint with the Chinese. But remember that I started this column, Global Print, by telling you that India had one eye on the U.S. presidential election. So it's very clear that in the last four years of the Trump administration, the the officials in the Trump administration have got along extremely well with the Indian administration, right from external affairs, S.J. Shankar, down to Foreign Secretary Harshringla. And before he became the foreign minister, Mr. J. Shankar was a diplomat. He was the foreign secretary. Before that, he was ambassador to the U.S. But primarily, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has led this very slow but very, very definite turn towards America. And naturally, we, we have seen this bonhomie between uh, Trump and Modi. We saw this in Houston last year at the Howdy Trump event, again in, in Ahmedabad earlier this year before covid when Trump came with his family to end the bath and he got this rapturous red carpet welcome. So the political principles on both sides, Prime Minister Modi and Donald Trump, basically laying the parameters, the sort of the the big picture under which the administration, the establishments on both sides, India and the US, have created a great deal of synergy. And On the face of it, India will always deny that it wants to ally itself with with the Americans. That word alliance is anathema to India. In fact, the last time there was an alliance between India and any other country was in 1971 with the Soviet Union, then called the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. And that too uh, was signed in 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 the time when the, when India and Pakistan were about to go to war uh, this was in the middle of 1971, and uh, then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi knew that she needed the help of another P5 power, that's a permanent five power at the time, the Soviet Union. Uh, you remember the Americans were assisting the Pakistanis, so she needed somebody else's help. That was the last time that India signed such a treaty of peace and friendship with any other country. But in today's world, in 2020, in this brave new 21st century, India is certainly not going to ally with another country. But that does not mean that India will not um, be not just friendly, but very friendly, will partner with countries which uh, with both with uh, with whose principles, democratic principles, it, it agrees, and also in its natural interest. So at a time when China is at the gates, not just at the gates, but inside the gates, has taken considerable territory. Again, if something happens, if the crisis escalates and the matter goes to the UN Security Council, India making sure that it has not just Russia on its side, but also the world's 
superpower, the most powerful country in the world, America, on its side. In the wake of the Quad meeting, the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, Stephen Begun, was in Delhi earlier this week. Again, he talked about China and how he doesn't use the words China being a common enemy, but everybody who heard what he said understood what he meant. So this, in a sense, this, that the democratic nations of the world are coming together to take on the mighty Chinese. So um, certainly the US, Japan, India, and Australia ranged against the Chinese. So that brings me to the crux of my column, which is that on the 26th and 27th of October, um, a few days from now, the two plus two dialogue between India and the US is going to take place. So the two plus two meaning the external affairs minister plus the defense minister of both India and the US. From the Indian side, therefore, you will have S. Jay Shankar as a foreign minister and Rajnath Singh as defense minister, who will be in talks with the U.S. Secretary of State, which is their foreign minister, Mike Pompeo, as well as what they call the defense secretary, Mark Esper. Now, both these gentlemen, Mike Pompeo, who has, by the way, just met Jay Shankar at the Quad meeting in Tokyo last week, and Mark Esper, the defense secretary, will be flying down to Delhi on the 26th for talks on this 2 plus 2 dialogue framework, barring, of course, a last-minute hurdle. So Pompeo and Mark Esper come to Delhi for talks on the 26th and 27th of October, and exactly one week later, the U.S. presidential election uh, is going to be held. Now, already for the U.S. Uh, election, ballots are being mailed, um, and you know millions of ballots have been coming in, and they are being counted. So in a sense, what happens on the 3rd is the actual voting. But in some ways, the voting has already started. And if you read the American media, you will see that the odds are that Biden is going to win and the heavy odds are that Biden is going to win. So you would ask yourself, why would Mike Pompeo and Mark Esper in this COVID crisis, uh, America is again, you know, the COVID situation is rearing its head again. Why would they fly halfway across the world to come to Delhi, especially when their administration is going to lose in a matter of days. And that is what gives you the clue, which is that the India and US administrations have worked so closely together these last four years uh, during the Trump era that this turn towards the US, which I talked about earlier, has now become um, is, is a visible fact. There is also some talk at this uh, 2 plus 2 dialogue that the basic exchange and cooperation agreement called BECA will be signed between the two countries. It's not been confirmed, so it may or may not happen. But there is considerable um, conversation regarding the signature of this BECA agreement. And if you take it in conjunction with the previous two defense agreements that have been signed, the first called the LEMOA, or the Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Agreement, and the second one called COMCASA, which is a Communications Compatibility and Security Agreement. So you had the LEMOA, the COMCASA, and now the BECA. And this three, the, the holy grail of the, the defense and strategic agreements between India and the US is now being signed. So sometimes you wonder what this alphabet soup of agreements really mean. Now, there has been um, a lot of uh, talk in the past about how the Kumkasa and the Lemoa signify an integration of the two defense forces. But what does that mean? Does that mean that the hardware, that the military hardware, in a sense, talk to each other, that they understand what they're saying? It, yes, that's true, that there is a significant convergence, a significant integration of the military hardware, of the communication capabilities between the two. Because if you know, the, um, I had said earlier to you that India is hugely dependent on Russian military hardware. Now, American military hardware and Russian military hardware are very different systems. So with India buying increasingly from the US because it wants to diversify and move away from the Russians, uh, doesn't want to put all its eggs into the Russian military basket, there, there was some sort of a, um, the, the, there was some sort of an issue with the, the integration capabilities of the two defense systems. 
So with the signature of Becca or the possible signature of Becca, what is happening is that not just these highly advanced weapon systems are going to are probably going to be much more integrated, but it also signifies a level of political trust between the two countries. You're not going to integrate your most sophisticated military hardware with that of another country if the political leaderships or if the two governments do not trust in each other totally. And I think the fact that these agreements have been signed in the public eye, but very few people recognize that they are really a game changer. And suddenly the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Stephen Bigun described this uh, during his visit to Delhi a few days ago as Pax Indo-Pacifica, so Australia um, bookending the Pacific Ocean on one end and India on the other end with the Indian Ocean and the four navies, the U.S., uh, Japan, Australia and India sort of commandeering this space. Now, if the Becca is signed um, during this two plus two dialogue, like I said, we don't know whether it's going to be or not. But if it is, that will be yet another example or another kind of proof that the two administrations, US and India, have become much more closer uh, to each other. Now, remember that on the 3rd of, of November, if Donald Trump loses, then the question is, does all this go out of the window? I would say no, because although the Indian American community, while it has been pretty much charmed by Trump, you know, Trump has sort of given it this um, much greater profile, much higher profile than it had all these past years. And there is proof that the Indian American community, while it has been significantly charmed by the Trump Republicans, does trust Kamala Harris, the vice presidential Democratic candidate, and feels much more closer to the Democrat ideology that both uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris stand for. So here is the big question. When November 3 dawns and when the votes are finally counted and if Donald Trump loses, does this mean that India will also lose in the White House on Capitol Hill, which is the American Parliament? And I would say that um, I don't think so that India in itself, the largest democracy in the world, somebody that brings a huge cachet to the table anywhere in any capital of the, of the universe, will also in a Biden democratic administration have that value and will always have that value. Remember that the US and India, the oldest and the largest democracies in the world, will talk to each other very frankly as they have done in the past. And we saw this under the Barack Obama administrations twice over and um, President Obama was in Delhi uh, too, just like Trump was earlier this year. But yes, there is a memory. People do remember that when Jay Shankar, the external affairs minister, was in uh, Washington DC last year, this was in the wake of the August 5 revocation of uh, Jammu and Kashmir's special status under Article 370. He refused to meet uh, some Democratic lawmakers. In fact, he cancelled a meeting with the Foreign Relations Committee because there would be some very uncomfortable voices asking him uncomfortable questions. And I would say that Mr. Jay Shankar should not have done that because India's democratic credentials are certainly proof of the fact that you're willing to absorb all kinds of criticism. You must do as you, as you believe right, of course. And the Modi government believed that Article 370 must be done away with. Having said that, in today's America, if Trump loses, if Biden becomes president, what happens to the India-US relationship? Will people remember that Jay Shankar canceled this meeting? They may remember, but I think the Americans would like to also look at the bigger picture, that these are the small nuts and bolts of differences that any two relationships have. And that the bigger picture today is one word, China. At the print, we will continue to track this relationship very closely, talk to you, tell you, write about how, this, how the manifestations of, the, of this very, very important relationship between India and the US has in India's neighborhood and across the world. But before that, dear viewer, let me remind you again once again, please, please do subscribe to The Print 
help us to bring you the best journalism that we can. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at The Print. Meanwhile, thank you so much for watching and do read my column Global Print on the website too.